Hi, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Alfred Addis. This is the American Independence Hour for Thursday, June 26th, the year of our Lord, 2008. You know, I was watching a Dr. Phil show just before this program began, and they had some mother there with her daughter who had run away repeatedly, 15-year-old daughter, run away from home repeatedly, prostituting herself, takes off to different parts of the country. They had to go through some fairly serious effort to try to even locate the little girl, bring her back. <sighs> there, of course, they, they caught up with her someplace where she was working as a prostitute, and hauled her back, and she was crying. She didn't want to go back to her mother, and she didn't want to go back to Dr. Phil's show. She'd already been there before. She said right there, as soon as you get me back, as soon as I'm going to run away just as fast as I get back there, I'll take off again. Everybody knows this. The story ends. The program ends. They're shipping the little girl off to some facility where they're going to keep her and try to give her a tune-up and uh, get her back on her feet and she can be a, make a productive contribution to society. But the problem is, and, and the mother in the case, they didn't see her shed a tear. She has apparently been hardened by the situation where she's just no longer emotionally involved in a meaningful sense. She had threatened to sue Dr. Phil. He talked about it at the beginning. Um, she had talked to somebody else. He's been trying to help her child in the past, had her off in some kind of treatments facility, and invested apparently a couple hundred thousand dollars in trying to get this child straightened out. And the mother's not satisfied with the results. She's threatening to sue Dr. Phil. And what I'm seeing is a woman who is simply vindictive, controlling, and not worth a damn, and the poor little girl's being destroyed by her own mother. And this is not an unusual story. The problem we have in this country, or at least one problem, is that the American woman has in large measure become a monster. We have women in this country, not all of them, but a big bunch of them, and maybe a majority, who think the only purpose for everyone else in life is to make them happy. I think it's the biggest mistake a man can make is saying, I'm going to make you happy because my experience, I've seen one woman in my life that was capable of being happy on a consistent basis, and that was my grandmother. Lives are being ruined while we pretend that every woman is acting in a, in a condition of rationality every time they decide to make a move. Lives are being ruined because we live in a society that seems dedicated to the idea that we have to make every woman. It's our job as men. If you have a if you have a vagina, then we have to kiss the ass of everyone who has a vagina hung on the front end of it. That's our job as men. And you women should feel free. Take the home, take the car, take the land, take anything you can get your hands on. Take the kids, ruin everybody's life, ruin the father's life, ruin the kid's life, ruin, it, ruin your own life. It doesn't matter because the only thing the world is here for is to make you happy. And if you're not happy, well, then it's only fair that the rest of the world be unhappy too. I'm frankly just so fed up with it that I can't see straight at times. This world, this country, not this world, this country bends over backwards to accommodate women and they have become in large measure nothing but a bunch of money-grubbing sluts who don't give a damn about anything but easy money and the hole between their legs. Try to find decent women. Go on, try to find them. Men don't talk about this, women don't talk about this, but who doesn't understand that this is a problem? There's an old saying, if mama's not happy, nobody's happy. And the idea behind that is we all got to go out of our way to make mama happy. Get out of the way and let the rest of us get on with our lives. There is nothing so extraordinary about having a vagina that you should be allowed to destroy the lives of everyone who's touched it. And we live in a society that's all oh, we just have to deal with any damn craziness you women come up with, mostly in divorce courts. We are caught in a society that declares, that believes in the maternal presumption, and nothing could be further from the truth. The truth of the matter is the most important parent in a child's life, the most important person in a child's life, is the biological father. Not the mother. Mom's primacy relative to the child ends at the point in time when the child is weaned. At the point in time when the child is no longer nursing on the mother, doesn't it? If the child is on the bottle, it's already, the woman's primacy is already gone. From that point forward, the most important relationship association in that child's life will be the association with the biological father. And depending on the quality 
and existence of that relationship, the child, it is the single most reliable predictor of whether the child will flounder or flourish in this life. Does the child have a positive relationship with his biological father? If the child does, odds are that child is going to do well, as well in the society as the child is inherently able to do. But you break that relationship, and that child is headed for trouble. And this is not an observation that is unique to myself. It's simply politically incorrect. And I don't doubt from my perspective it's part and parcel of the same crap. We have a system that's trying to open the borders and let illegal aliens flood in here. We have a system that's taken the wealthiest nation on earth and reduced it to the world's biggest debtor nation. We are teetering on the edge of an economic and perhaps social collapse, and we are there not by accident but by intent. I don't doubt for a minute that the people who have pushed us into this period, into this position of vulnerability, are the same people that are encouraging us to believe in the maternal presumption. The Bible doesn't believe in it. There's nobody who can claim to be a Christian and say, oh, I believe in the maternal presumption. Read the Bible. Look for the word fatherless and look for the word motherless in the Bible. You'll find the word fatherless 44 times in the Bible. Depending on what version you look at, you may find there may be some some variation in numbers depending on which version you're looking at. But I've done a study on it in the past. The word fatherless is there 44 times. The word motherless is there once. I don't believe that disparity, that disproportionality is accidental. I believe they understood thousands of years ago, you lose your mother, it's a problem. You lose your father, you're in great trouble. About 18 of those 44 verses that reference father are verses that are along this line. They are a command from God brought to the the attention of the people by means of a prophet where he says, do not oppress, speaking to the wealthy and the powerful, he said, do not oppress the widows and the fatherless. What's that mean? It means that the widows and the fatherless are easily oppressed. That's what it means. It's not simply a commandment where it says, look, these people got enough trouble, don't don't pick on them anymore. It's more than that. It is a formula. If you can get that father out of the house, you wind up with a widow, or at least a, a wife without a husband, and you wind up with children without a father. And they knew 3,000 years ago that children without fathers were more easily oppressed. It is a formula. It's not simply a command. It is a formula for those who would engage in oppression in this life. First thing you want to do, you want to raise a class of people who are easily oppressed? Get the father out of the home. Feed the people some crap about the maternal presumption. Tell them how important it is that they have a mother. And forget that asshole father. You don't need to worry about him. All you need is a mom. And so, and her precious love will steer you through all the problems of life. It's a bunch of crap. It's no accident that they are removing fathers from homes. It's no accident that we live in a society that celebrates everything that's attached to a vagina and denigrates everyone who is a father. It's not an accident. But they get away with it, and they're going to keep getting away with it because women enjoy it. They enjoy the maternal presumption. They enjoy saying, listen, we want equal rights. We just don't want equal responsibilities. We want equal rights for women, but not equal rights for men. We don't want to divide the kids up in any sort of an equal fashion in the event of a divorce. No, no. We want everything men have, but there's some things we got to have extra because we're women. We have vaginas. Yeah. And that entitles us. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if our our character, our intelligence, our ability, they're irrelevant. All you need is a vagina. You go to divorce court and you can win. And what it is in the end is you women are trading on your whole. You understand? There is no difference from the maternal presumption in a divorce court and a prostitute standing on the street. You're trading on your whole has nothing to do with character, it has nothing to do with value, it has nothing to do with intelligence or ability, just say, hey judge, look, I've got a vagina, give me the kids, give me the house, give me the car, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, because I'm entitled, because I have a vagina. And we have a world that's accepted that, and it does so in violation of that fundamental principle we find again in the Bible, about 18 verses say, do not oppress the widows and the fatherless. Again, what does it tell us? It's a warning to the rich and powerful, don't do it. 
But again, it is also a formula. If you are bent on oppression, the widows and the fatherless are easily oppressed. The children who are raised in a fatherless condition will be easily oppressed throughout their lives. They will grow up without the sense of self-esteem, self-confidence, self-worth, personal security that is essential to be able to function confidently in a society. It doesn't mean that they're not capable of violence, but it does mean that they are, un, they are less able to stand up and defend themselves in civil he circumstances. So nice. He seemed fatherless. That's what he seemed. And he finally had enough of it, and he finally flipped his flipped out, and, and people died. But while the fatherless are capable of violence, they are not capable not as capable, and this isn't a universal rule, but it is a tendency. They are less able to assert themselves. They are less able to resist authority. And the reason is because they lack the sense of self-worth that flows, so far as I can see, primarily from a father. If, that father is, if, if the father is missing, the child is going to be impaired. It doesn't happen 100% of the time. There's people who live, grow up in fatherless homes, and they, they survive and even flourish. But odds are they won't, and everyone knows it. There is no evidence to support the contention that children who grow up in motherless homes are similarly impaired. And the idea that <clears throat> a child being raised without a father is more easily oppressed, not only as a child, but even as an adult, is borne out in the laws of Rome, the Roman Empire, where the children of free men, in the event that there was a, the family broke up, there was a divorce or whatever, the children of free men always went with a father. The children of slaves went with a mother. They understood clearly 3,000 years ago that if you want a nation that's capable of being free, you have got to keep those kids associated with their fathers. And here we are in a society that celebrates the maternal presumption, which incidentally is a title of nobility and could probably, which is prohibited by the both state and federal constitutions, certainly by the federal constitution from both the federal government and state governments, shouldn't be allowed to issue any titles of nobility, and that's what they do with the maternal presumption. It's subject to challenge. But lives are being ruined and destroyed every single day because the women of this country uh, will be damned before they'll admit that they are not competent to raise children on their own. And I started this out saying the women, the American women, have become monstrous. There's a man in this room, in this room, in this world, who can safely marry an American woman? How can you dare? You know half of the time it's going to end up in divorce, and what's going to happen then? You're going to be ruined, fella. Half the marriages in this country end in divorce. And why do they end in divorce? Government statistics out of the 90s, I don't know what the current statistics are, but statistics in the 90s, government said 70% of all divorces were filed by women, which means the poor little innocent moms are about twice as likely to file for divorce as men. Men's groups say the number is closer to 90% filed by women. And the courts, of course, love it because they understand that women will go, off their, go out of their mind every 30 days while they're having their period, and they'll see the toilet seat up and call a lawyer and file for divorce, which just generates great money for two attorneys. It'll ruin the family, it'll destroy the children's lives, but women aren't about to step back from it. They're not about to do what's right because everybody in the society is running around praising everybody who's got a vagina. It's got to end. And now, now we're in a situation where young women today are under incredible stress. And it's a shame and it's unfortunate, but they are going to wind up paying for the excesses of their mothers and their grandmothers. We've had two generations of women who've been spoiled rotten. We've had two generations of women who have collectively murdered over 40 million children in this country. We have two generations of women who have collectively murdered six times as many people as Hitler was accused of murdering in the form of the concentration camps during World War II. And yet we're all going to sit back and say, you little moms are just so precious and you're just so dear. Wake up. You are destroying lives around you. And it's high time that the women of this country became responsible rather than smug, conceited, and understanding and delighting in the fact that they can destroy the lives around them. It's high time that it comes to an end. I, what I'm, and, I, and I want you to understand something. I am a feminist. You understand that? This program right now is dedicated to the idea of equal rights for women. 
but it's also dedicated to equal responsibility. And that's something that women are not about to assume. They have been unwilling. They say, oh, responsibilities, silly rabbit. The responsibilities are for men. It's like tricks that serial some of you might remember. But rights are for women and responsibilities are for men. It has to end. It's one of the ways this society is being destroyed. And women, again, they are right now about, what, a quarter of the children that are conceived in this society are being aborted. They're being murdered by their own mothers. Of the remaining three, you know, for every four children that are conceived, mom murders one out of four. Now we can sit back and say, well, it's only one out of four. Yeah, but I'm going to tell you something. Of the remaining three who survived, odds are mom gave serious consideration to murdering at least one or two of them. You understand that? Your dear little sainted mom, she's murdering one, on average one out of every four children that she conceives. And she's probably thinking very seriously about whacking one or two more while we sit back and celebrate how sweet the women of this country are. After one in four is murdered in the form of abortion, three are given or brought to live birth. One of those three will be born out of wedlock. Mom is so busy playing the slut that she doesn't actually care to go out and get herself married. She's so busy. <laughs> you know, one of the things that just absolutely appalls me is the idea that women think they can screw like a man. And that's where this society has come. Thanks to the pill, in large measure, women are out there fornicating, moving from man to man, just having a great old time. It's the sort of thing men can afford to be promiscuous, because men, in the end, don't wind up carrying the children. Women, in theory, shouldn't be able to afford to be promiscuous. They can now that we have the pill. And a lot of them are promiscuous even without the pill. But the truth of the matter is a woman cannot screw like a man. And we have a society that is encouraging women to believe they have this equality. There's no such thing. Nothing could be further from the truth. This whole thing, this is a subject that I get off on, I suppose, about once every two years. And I imagine I deliver a pretty similar rant every time I do it. But something has got to be done. And it isn't going to be done simply by men yelling and screaming over a damn radio program. It's going to be done if and when the women in this country finally get to a point where they start behaving in a responsible manner and begin to recognize that they are not the beginning and end of the earth. That the world does not exist for the sole purpose of making them happy. That their happiness, which is fragile on a good day, is not sufficient cause, reason, rationale to destroy the lives of their own children. Where was I going with it? Again, with, let me get back on this notion of four children. Not every four children. One is aborted. One is born without a father. And of the remaining two that are born into wedlock, one of them is going to go through a divorce. Right now, we only have one child out of every four that's conceived. Only one is going to actually live and have an opportunity to have a positive relationship with their biological father. One in four. The other three will be separated from their biological father either by murder or by simple promiscuity or by divorce. And somewhere between 70 and 90 percent of those divorces will be filed by our sainted little moms. I watched the Dr. Phil program today and I see this little girl whose life is being destroyed. And it is. She's out there screwing 50 guys. She's 15 years old. She admits to having sex with 50 guys in the last couple of weeks as a prostitute. Where do you think it's going to go? But it is, you look at the woman sitting next to her, her mother. You look at her. You look at the woman who was threatening to sue Dr. Phil and blaming everybody but herself. The best thing that could have happened to that little girl is if her mother had died years ago and that little girl had been left to be raised by her father. That little girl would have had a chance at life. And somewhere along the line, someone has got to get the women in this country under control. I don't know how that's going to happen. I think it might happen in the context of an economic collapse. I'd say it might be one of the silver linings of the upcoming collapse in our economy and our society because things are going to get so damn difficult that we will not be able to afford the fiction of the maternal presumption. We're not going to be able to afford the lie that women are competent to raise children by themselves. It's not only true that the society won't be able to afford it, even women aren't going to be able to afford it. And if and when that takes place, then we will approach a time at least where once again we might even have something like a stable family. We aren't going to have much money, but we might have a stable family. Or maybe not, who knows. But there is something deeply wrong 
with the female gender in this country, and it's not exclusively them, it's wrong with men too. It's not just a question where women are wrong, men are wrong. We've put up with this crap. We spend too much time saying, yes dear, yes dear, yes dear. The dress doesn't make your ass look fat dear. Yeah, it does your ass is fat. Stop asking me to lie. You are fat. You understand? It's the way God made you. Grow up. If you can't, if you need to extort lies out of everybody, for God's sake, you know, again, take the knife to your wrists and be gone. Well, I guess I got that more or less off my chest for right now, but it is one of those things that it's a fundamental problem. It's a fundamental problem in this society. You know, we see this. They did this to the African American community. The African American community was closing the economic gap relative to whites after World War II. And starting out in 1963, we decided they were African Americans who were making progress. They were making gains on their own. They had what was at that time a high rate of children being born out of wedlock, with something like 10%, only 1% or 2% among whites. But the government, Democrats, decided to pick up the white man's burden and help our beloved black brothers and sisters. And they would provide welfare, aid to families with dependent children. And part of the condition of that damned welfare program was they'd give money, they'd give money to black women, you have all the children you want, we'll pay for them. But there was a condition. And the condition is you've got to get that old black tomcat out the house. In other words, we'll give you the money, but you can't keep a man in the family. And the black women, like a bunch of damn fools, they took the money. And that's not unusual. I'd say that's, I'd say that's typical of most women's mentality. They'd rather have the money than the man. Result? We have now had a couple of generations of African-American children. Now the, the, the illegitimacy rate is something like 70%. We've got several generations of black children who don't know what a father is. They've never even seen one. If you can tell me how a boy raised without a father can be an effective father, I'd like to know how. Because I don't think fatherhood is something that is innate. I don't think it's something that you do instinctively. I think it's something that's learned. And if you haven't seen your own father treat you properly, <clears throat> the chances that you're going to be able to treat your children properly are dramatically redu reduced. Won't say it's impossible, but it's unlikely. What did they do to this country? They they knocked the they knocked the father out of the African American community and made the blacks more easily oppressed. They're not going to march again like they did in the sixties. You won't see civil rights again, not from the African Americans. And they've done pretty much the same thing with whites by means of the maternal presumption in divorce courts. The nation is being ruined while we fool around and embrace this nonsense about a maternal presumption. It's got to stop. Hi, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Alfred Addis. This is the American Independence Hour, and I am ranting about women. I thought I was done at halftime, but actually I got a little more to say. Women need to wake up. Not because you're decent, not because you're nice, but because you are in terrible jeopardy. Right now we live in a society that is roughly, we are pushing to where we have about 53% women. You are the political majority. Hooray! Hooray! Women are the majority. Gee, things are going to change now, aren't they? Let me tell you something about political majority. When I was a young man, I went to a couple of places, Washington, D.C. being one of them, Northern Illinois University being another one, where the population at that time was something like 70-80% women in Washington, D.C. They provided, they were most of the secretaries and the bureaucracy. And out at Northern Illinois University, and I'm talking back in the 60s, the population there, that was primarily a girls' school. It was something like 90, 95% women. And this was a time when the world was a fairly conservative and seemingly moral place. I visited Northern Illinois University. You had women whistling out the window at me while I'm walking down the street. I saw women climb out of windows in their dorms to come chasing after any man that was going down, the, going walking down the road. The same thing... I won't even get into the details, but much the same thing was going on in Washington, D.C. And one of the things that I've observed over the years is if you want to see a moral society, you're going to be looking for more of a society where women are in a minority rather than a majority. And I believe there's good reason for that. When women are in a minority, they are highly valued. Right? This is just supply and demand. This isn't, this is, if there's, you take, uh, an example that comes to mind, an illustration. Uh, well, I'll give, the, I'll give you the illustration in a moment. But when there are more men than women in a society, that's when you will see men treat women with care and courtesy. That's when women get to pick and choose. Right? They get to choose 
let's see, which husband, because a woman has an opportunity to pick between several men as to which one she's going to have her husband. But when we have a situation as we do now where women are becoming the majority, guess what? There is serious competition among women to gather, to, to, to gain, to gain, take, to, to uh, I don't know, marry, take control of, take possession of, put your own language on it, the, the relatively few men. Now, if we take a look at society and we say 53% of the population is female, at first glance you're going to sit back and say, well, that's no big deal. Just means there's an extra three women out of every hundred. That's the way most people would look at it, but that's not so. A 53 percent. We're not quite. We're not at that level yet, but we're approaching it. When the population is 53 percent female and 47 percent men, it's not an extra three women per hundred. It's an extra six women per hundred. There are 47 men and 53 and 53 women. There's a difference of six. What that means is that at any given moment, it's physically impossible for six women out of 53 to be in the company, exclusive company of a man. There's only 47 men and there's 57 or 53 women. The numbers don't sound like, uh, at the first glance, they don't sound all that impressive. But when you look at it a little deeper and you say, wait a second, that's an extra six women out of 53. You understand? We're talking something like 10, 12, 15 percent of the women in this country. It is mathematically impossible for them to have a man. There's only 47 men for every 53 women, or we're fast approaching that point. We're talking about 10 percent of the women in this country can't have a man. Women are no longer in a position where they get to pick and choose. And at the same time, men are no longer in a position where they have to be on their good behavior. We are now in a position where a man can literally abuse a woman. If she doesn't like it, what's she going to do? Huh? Go find another one? Good luck, babe. Not many of them out there, are there? We are now in a position where men are in a position empowered to become abusive and women are in a position to become, um, become incredibly dependent. And not only in incredibly dependent, but incredibly compliant. I've watched TV programs where they are talking to young girls, high school girls, who are explaining that oral sex right, is like shaking hands. It's no big thing. The girls are just routinely giving oral sex to their boyfriends. And it's not a, it's on TV. That program, I believe it was Oprah program one time talking about. It. This is back a couple of years ago. It's no big thing. I think this is a reflection of the change in demographics where women who are historically in the minority are now in the majority. I think that women are now in a position where the stress of competition between women to gain a man is so serious that they are now willing to do virtually anything in order to get that man. Now, that's my theory. I can't prove it, but to me it makes a certain amount of sense, and I, that there's an intuitive sensibility to it. Maybe you agree with it, maybe you don't. But if it is true... All it means is on top of everything else, how are women even going to maintain the illusion that there's something special about being a mom or there's something special about being a woman? A woman cannot have sex with 20, 50, 100 guys and sit down and everybody's going to say, well, golly, isn't she just, that's the sweetheart of Sigma Chi. Women can't be. I wouldn't even say men can be it, but they, they, men can't be promiscuous routinely and get away with it and expect to come to happy endings. With a man, it's the sort of thing that is, to some degree, tolerated and to some degree celebrated. With a woman, I don't see how a woman is ever going to be promiscuous and yet expect to come to a happy ending. However, we live in a society where there are 53, or very nearly so we're approaching that point, 53 women for every 47 men. An extra six women out of 100, but that's an extra six out of every 53 women. Again, we're talking something like 11, 12 percent. The, the competition is going to put young women in this country under incredible stress. I don't believe they're even happy themselves playing the slut. I think they're called on to do it because young boys, young men, you know, what, to, what can I tell you? Uh, the human male is more than willing, uh, eager to insert himself into pretty much any female orifice that makes itself available. It's the nature of the, it's the nature of the species, historically, women were the break, the moral break on promiscuity. They're not anymore. Where are we going with this? You know, where can this go? How are we going to have a happy ending? I don't understand. I, honest God, can't understand how young men are even bothering to get married. If you don't 
understand, if you don't know your wife in this society, if you haven't known her for a long time before you were married, and you are absolutely certain that she is fundamentally monogamous, we now live in a society where you have to presume the woman that you are interested in has probably slept with God knows how many other men. I am unable to understand. Maybe I am just too old to get it. Right? But I am unable to understand how a man can marry a slut. A woman, he understands, has been sleeping with God knows how many other men and have any respect for her. I don't understand it. I don't know how they're going to do it. Maybe they can do it. Maybe the younger generation, maybe it's no big thing for them. Maybe I just don't get it. But I think that if your wife has been promiscuous as a young woman, I don't understand what's going to keep her from being promiscuous once you're married. And what are you going to do about it? File for divorce? Take her to a damn divorce court where you understand that if you walk in as a man, you are necessarily going to be the bad guy in the situation, and they're going to punish you and give her everything she wants, or at least that's the way it will typically work out. Now, there are people who would argue there's divorce court lawyers say, oh, no, when there's, when there's a real battle for custody, men have every bit as much right to get the children in the property. There's a 50-50, roughly, when there's a real custody battle. Men get the kids about half the time. Yeah, when there's a real custody battle, that will cost you seventy five or dollars or $100,000. In other words, wealthy men, yeah, they'll get the kids half the time. But for the vast majority of people who can't afford to spend $75,000 on a full-blown custody battle, 50000 75 I don't know how much it costs anymore, but it ain't given, you're not going to get a custody battle for five grand. If you can't afford the fight, I guarantee they're going to give the kids to mom. And in doing so, the children will be impaired. And the moms of the world don't give a damn. Everybody knows it. Everyone knows that the children raised without fathers are going to be impaired. Everybody knows. It's not a secret. We try to dance around and we talk about single parent families. Children are raised in single parent families. See, it doesn't matter though. All it is is you only have one parent as opposed to two parents. They try to make the question of parenting a question of mathematics. Sure, it's better to be raised in a two-parent family than in a one-parent family. What if we follow, if we follow that logic? That? If it's only a question of mathematics, then it would be even better to be raised in a three-parent family. So why don't we have uh, why, why don't we have multiple marriages? Hmm? Why can't a man have two wives or a wife have two husbands? Or perhaps we could have three men being married together or three women being married together. Wouldn't that be better? Isn't three better than two and two better than one? We use the language single parent families to conceal the real, the truth of the problem. And what we mean by single parent families, what we mean 95% of the time is a fatherless home. That's what we mean. And we argue. You know, I mean, Dr. Phil is going to take this little girl that started this program talking about a 15 year old girl who's out selling herself as a prostitute running away from home on multiple occasions, already invested a couple hundred thousand dollars in trying to give her psychiatric care, some sort of care. Now they're going to give her another dose. That ain't going to work. What the child needed was a father. And nobody even wants to talk about that. Nobody even wants to. They're just saying he's, he's talking to the mom and he congratulates her about how tough she is because she doesn't want to take the daughter back. All right? This mother in this case that was on television tonight, she doesn't want to take the daughter back because she knows the daughter will leave right away. But the mother's, the daughter incidentally is pregnant, 15 years old, prostitute, pregnant. She is not, she does not have AIDS. She hasn't picked up any sexually transmitted diseases, but she is pregnant. The word comes out on the program and the mother is unmoved. There's not a tear in her eye. This is a situation that I look at and I say to me, if I was on that program, I'd say, Mom, where's Dad? And I'd listen to some cock and bull story about how there was a divorce and there were irreconcilable differences. I don't care if you've got irreconcilable differences. If you are married and you have children, you don't file for a divorce unless somebody has committed physical violence against the other members of the family. Under those circumstances, yeah, I can go along with a divorce. But irreconcilable differences, all that means is you want a fresh man between your legs. That's all it means. Or maybe you don't want any man at all. But what it ultimately means is somebody is saying, I don't give a damn about my, my oath to God, and I don't give a damn about the welfare of the children, and I don't give a damn about the welfare of my spouse. I want what I want. 
and I'm prepared to destroy every life around me to have what I want. If I were making the laws on divorce, I guarantee you the way it'd be. You want a divorce? Fine. You can have a divorce anytime you want. But here's the deal. If you file for a no-fault divorce, if you don't have cause, that you can demonstrate and prove that the spouse has been physically abusive, sexually abusive, whatever, if all you got is irreconcilable differences, you want a no-fault divorce, I understand that, because, and I don't care whether it's man or woman. You want a no-fault divorce, we'll give you one. But here's the deal, Bubba. You're going to lose custody, okay? Because what you're saying is your personal happiness is more important than not only your spouse's happiness, but also the happiness and future of your children. Anyone who files for that no-fault divorce is only saying, me, 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 it's all about me, it's all about me. I want what I want, to hell with everybody else. And to hell even with my oath to God. To hell with all of it, it's all about me. Do what thou wilt is exactly the fundamental motto of, I can't remember his name, but witchcraft, sorcery, Satanism. Do what thou wilt, doesn't matter, whatever you want, do what you want to do. Do what you want to do. Don't do what God says. Don't do what you promised to do. Change your mind any time you want. You're entitled. Your women are entitled to change your mind any time you want. Yeah. No, you're not. It's time the women in this country started behaving themselves like adults rather than responsible adults, rather than a pack of greedy, money-grubbing sluts who think they can get away with murder because they have been getting away with murder. Forty million children murdered by their moms in my lifetime. What? A little over 40 years now? Something like 40 years, abortion's been legalized. We're talking about, I don't know, a million children a year on average. Murdered. That's all. Mom, it's inconvenient to have the child, so let's just kill the child. But we're still going to just respect you ladies. We respect. I just want you girls to know that, boy, do we men respect you. Because, after all, it's not like you kill all your children, right, girls? You just kill one out of four. So there's cause for real celebration, and maybe we should even have a special award for Mother's Day from the survivors. The children, let's have a special award for Mom on Mother's Day from the children she didn't murder. We could have a card from Hallmark that says, Thanks, Mom, for not murdering me. And we could have, we wouldn't sell many. <laughs> I mean, all of the kids' survivors, all of the children today, they could buy the card. Thank you, Mom, for not murdering me. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. And for some of them who still even have their, father, their biological father, they can say, thanks, Mom, for not murdering me and for not stripping me of my relationship to my biological father and thereby crippling me. <clears throat> it's a hallmark moment, folks. Let me give you one more point, though. And in all of this, you've got to recognize that from an historical, a biological perspective, Women are the most valuable member of the species. Women are more valuable innately than men. Do you understand that? Most people wouldn't think that from listening to what I've said up until now, but it's the truth. Women have always been and will always be, and that's why they're allowed to get away with murder, because they're more valuable. Why are they more valuable? <clears throat> you can see that answer in the Bible to some degree. There's a passage in there where God says, Go forth, be fruitful, and populate the earth. Well, insofar as that is the mandate of not only our species, but virtually every species. I guarantee, from the sparrow's perspective, you know, the, what the world needs is more sparrows. And cats believe if it was up to cats, there'd be nothing but cats in the world. And the same thing with every other species. Every species is constantly fighting to survive and propagate, and not merely maintain its numbers, but expand its numbers. Now, we run into environmental limits on that. I mean, there are limits and species die. They over, you get too many animals, uh, too many rabbits in a particular area, and all of a sudden the rabbits start dying for lack of food, or too many wolves. They clean out all the prey, and then the wolves start to starve to death. There is a balance, we understand that, but nevertheless, given that the fundamental drive in the species is to propagate, women, insofar as that's true, women are more valuable than men. And the reason for that is that you can take a population of, that's 50-50. Take 100 people, 50 of them are adult men, 50 of them are adult women. How many, how large, what can the population be a year from now? It could be 150. Operating on the assumption that all 50 of the females were fertile and all 50 of them conceived, 
then we can go from a hundred population of one hundred. That's a hundred. That's fifty men and fifty women. And next year we have a hundred and fifty. We've got fifty adult women, fifty adult men, and fifty children. We could have a population that was ninety-nine men and one woman. Now what's the population going to be next year? Population is going to be a hundred and one. We've only got one woman. We've only got one vagina. Only one birth canal. Only one set of ovaries. Only one fertile womb. And it is for this reason, this, the fertile womb is the bottleneck in reproduction. And having the fertile womb is the reason why women have always been favored. Huh? It's the reason why people opened the doors and carried the packages and treated women with courtesy. Why? Because women, if you didn't, they didn't give birth. And even when they did, birth extracted a terrible price. A hundred years ago, women died much earlier than men. 200 years ago, a woman's life expectancy was maybe 30 years. The rigors of childbirth killed women. And men went on to live an extra 20, 25 years. And children wound up being raised by their fathers. And the, the, the first wife would die and he'd go out and marry another one. It was the nature of our species. But we have, men have, men, incidentally, men have advanced a medical establishment that's able to protect women and keep them from dying in childbirth. And on top of that, they've advanced a situation where women now, thanks to the pill, they don't have to have children. They can be contenders all their lives. Baby, you can be looking good. You don't have to have children. But what's happening? The society is dying. Well, the point I'm trying to make, and I'm going to run out of time before I can make it adequately, is that women have always been more valuable than men. Again, we use the example of 99 men and one woman. One woman. You're only going to have a population of 101 next year. You could have a society, however, of 99 women and just one man. I guarantee you the one man can impregnate 99 women. With one man and 99 women, we could, the society, imagine a little tribe. That tribe can be doubled in size by next year. One man, that's all it takes. This is the reason why men were historically the disposable members of our society. They were the ones who went off to war. They're the ones who worked in the coal mines. They're the ones who risked dangers outside of the tribe. Because we didn't need them. But today we live in a society where women aren't giving birth. And insofar as they're not, their value has been diminished enormously. They have become essentially a collection of dead holes. They are sperm receptacles. If you're on the pill, you're a sperm receptacle. That's what you are. Women complain, men treat me like a sperm receptacle. Yes, that's what you are. If you're on the pill... Women have abandoned the fundament, the essence of their value, which is the capacity to give birth. It's been abandoned. It's been passed on. And yet they want to command the same respect that they once enjoyed. It's not going to happen. And as a result, I have no idea what's going on in this country, but in terms of gender relationships, it's one of those things where, boy, I'll tell you, if this isn't as tough as it can be, I don't know, I don't know how it can get much worse. We're out of time. I doubt that I've ad addressed this program adequately, but at least it felt good to me. I want to thank you all for listening. I'll be back next week, and we'll deal with something that is a list thus ranting, hopefully. But maybe not. You can never tell. I'm Alfred Addis. This is the American Independence Hour. Thanks for listening. Have a good weekend. God bless you all. Good night. <laughs>